Welcome to the Longest Day podcast. I'm Leah, your host and the founder of Broadstairs Consulting. We help rebuild relationships and facilitate effective dialogue. We are convinced that people matter and that conversations count. So we started The Longest Day, a series of conversations where we learn from the resilience, determination, and candor of our guests. As they look back on their longest days, our hope is that it will empower you to look forward. We hope their stories will be a part of shaping yours. Today on The Longest Day, we welcome Caroline, who has enjoyed a 30-year career in professional motorsport. From organization, logistics, VIP hospitality, press liaison, and merchandise, she has worked alongside the majority of circuits and governing bodies of the sport. She organized global motorsport events whilst running a sports car championship consisting of 60 international teams. As you will hear from this episode, she has an excellent understanding of marketing and PR, and now for commercial negotiation. Her expertise lies in brand management, sponsorship, and commercial partnerships. She worked at Silverstone on the world's largest racing and rock festival over 10 years, as well as on the World Grand Prix Bike Legends, the Veteran Car Run, and the Regent Street Motor Show. Now semi-retired from motorsport, Caroline is based in Sandwich, Kent. Well, Caroline, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being willing to come on The Longest Day. Absolute pleasure. Why don't you tell our listeners about your longest day? So after um, a 28-year career in motor racing, um, the challenge was thinking of the longest day because, to be brutally honest, there have been a few. Um, With that being said, I think the one that probably sticks in my mind the most was um, back in the year 2000, um, which was um, representing chapter one of my career, which was when I was running um, an international sports car series called the International Super Sports Cup. And that was eight races uh, globally, supported by 70 drivers and cars and their teams. And we regularly ran 30 to 40 car races. In preparation of the 2000 Grand Prix, eight months before, we were contacted by the Australian Grand Prix Corporation, who had secured a sponsor, um, Shannon's International Auction House, And um, they had kindly offered to pay for the cars to be shipped to Melbourne for two practices, one qualifying and three races prior to the 2000 Australian Grand Prix. So if we put our minds back to that time, um, we had Michael Schumacher regularly on the grid for that race itself. Mika Hakkinen was on pole and a young driver by the name of Jensen Button made his Grand Prix debut. Um, so that's the the kind of the era that we're talking about. So in these times, um, which makes me feel extremely old, um, there was really no email. So we were faxing backwards and forwards for an eight month period and found teams in America, Canada, all over Europe, and even a few in Australia who had suitable cars. And we launched um, the, we made the the main press release um, in Monaco at a nightclub um, hosted by Gerhard Berger, who made the announcement that um, the International Super Sports Cup would be attending the 2000 Qantas Grand Prix, which was monumental. We had to um, negotiate the contract, which those of you who remember the yellow pages will understand when I say it was as thick, if not thicker, than the yellow pages. And whilst we had um, legal consultants look at it and advise us, the the thing that stuck out and that was really not negotiable and that concerned us the most was that we had to underwrite the cost of the loss of the TV rights if anything went wrong with our race. And we were directly before the race, um, the Formula One race on the Sunday. So that was a massive undertaking and a huge responsibility. Um, But the background on our drivers is whilst they were professional amateur drivers, um, they were personally financed, high net worth individuals, very, very successful in business um, and didn't require sponsorship other than, you know, to get them there. Um, And they were extremely competitive, extremely competitive drivers um, and always, without fail, put on an amazing show. So we knew that it wasn't taking a load of rookies. So we were confident that we had the skills and the ability on track, um, that it wouldn't be a problem and never had been a problem before. 
So we um, were told um, by uh, the Formula One organising committee, so the Australian Grand Prix Corporation, that we had to provide footage, high quality footage of our series to use in all promotion. So we took a camera crew at our expense to Magni Corps and straight from Magni Corps, which was the race before Australia, so the last race of 99, we went um, to the Mercedes shipment um, facility. The cars were deep cleaned, shipped dry and sent to Australia. Um, so I then coordinated the hospitality, the Grand Prix ball, the driver's cocktail reception at the governor's house, the flights, the accommodation, the transfers, the pits, the sponsorship, the contracts, the circuit liaison and so on, which was, as I said, a, a massive, massive undertaking. We um, took off um, from London Heathrow and landed in Melbourne to um, see Mr Tim Banford from the Australian Grand Prix Corporation, who was a little shaken. So we went and had a quiet meeting in a room and he shared the very, very sad news with us that while we were in the air, the CEO and owner and founder of Shannon's, our sponsor, Mr Robert Shannon, had sadly passed away. And this name, this legendary brand was all across our race and understandably the family needed a minute to think about what best to do. So at that point, potentially, they could have morally said, we don't want the race to go ahead and that would have been a, a, a huge blow for all concerned. So we left the decision with the families. We didn't tell um, the teams. We decided um, that um, we would just sit on this and see what they wanted to do. And very generously, they came back and said that they wanted the, the race to go ahead in Robert's memory, but could we display black ribbons on the car, which um, was a wonderful request. But in terms of practicality at uh, Monza, our cars were faster down the straightaway than the Formula One cars. So we were clocked at 212 miles per hour. So there was no way these black ribbons were staying on the car. So I found myself in the Australian qu equivalent of B&Q, buying black gaffer tape and distributing it to the teams and asking them to put black stripes across the nose of every car. And we agreed that the um, the chaps who were uh, lucky enough to go onto the podium for the three races uh, would be mindful of their celebrations and um, not spray the champagne. Um, so that was what we all agreed and we continued. There was a huge auction um, of memorabilia and cars from Shannon's that weekend that went ahead, as did our race. Um, so I found myself in our new village, in our new home in Melbourne, um, surrounded by some of the greatest icons of Formula One and, of course, some of the most beautiful sports cars ever produced from the 60s and 70s in my own little paddock. Practice went without hitch. The guys were absolutely thrilled with the circuit. It's a 3.3 street circuit, fundamentally, that's built in Albert Park. And to watch this circuit grow from the ground up during the week we were there was absolutely monumental, as it must be said was the strike, which took place in 24 hours. But to to send everybody out racing, knowing that the gravel had just been freshly painted, was, was really quite remarkable. We did qualifying. Qualifying went without incident. And then up to race one, these cars were extremely wide. And um, in, for the purposes of this interview... I've had the original footage digitised um, to share with your listeners. Um, and with Melbourne, you have a very, very long, wide straightaway, which then, very similar to Zandvoort and Tarzan, goes down to from three cars to two cars. And because these guys have red mist and they are massive cars with eight, nine-litre engines, we decided that discretion was the better part of valour and we would, um, in association with the organisers, um, agree that we would wave yellow flags, which means no overtaking, into Turn 1 until they got out of Turn 1 when the circuit then opened up and they were free to go. But we were ever mindful of this huge clause um, which stated that we were going to have to underwrite the television rights if anything went wrong. 
So that was the key learn from Friday's race and Saturday's race. Um, again, went without hitch. Um, very, very, very spectacular. Um, all of the F1 drivers came out to look. Um, and that was a pinch me moment to see people like Barrichello, Coulthard, Schumacher out on the grid just with their mouths open in awe of these wonderful, wonderful cars. Race two um, went without incident, but one of the drivers came to me and said he had um, been overtaken on the first turn and that he wasn't going to um, agree to obey the rule the next day, which we brokered, discussed, eased and said, no, that's all fine. But there was tension when we um, pre-gridded um, and went out to grid on Sunday which is understandable because it's the biggest day in most of these chaps and certainly in my life and my career, um, leading um, the way to the 2000 Formula One Grand Prix. These cars are so powerful, they have to do a rolling start. If you um, did a standing start, you just rip the back axle out. So it was practice that we'd always have a rolling start. So the cars would be led out by a pace car the pace car would peel off um, at the, the start line and the lights um, would go red, um, amber, green. And we always had to remind the guys that the race didn't start when the lights changed. It started when they crossed the start-finish line. Otherwise, we could end up with some interesting um, pickles at the back of the grid. We have, were live on television um, we had um, the legendary John Watson commentating who had raced these cars in period as well as Formula One cars. So it was just one of those absolute pinch me moments of perfection. Um, beautiful sunny day, 20 degrees on track. Um, Albert Park, you race around a, a boating lake in the park and everything just felt never better. The BMW pace car pulled the chaps away. The mechanics, of which there were probably 300, went into the pit lane. And we undertook our rolling start, as we always would. And the BMW pace car pulls in. The lights change. The engines roar to such an extent. If you stand in the pit lane, it... It doesn't just hurt your ears, it hurts your stomach. The ground shakes. If you can picture 40 cars between 9.1 and 2 litres just thundering past you at pace. And all of these people are your friends, your associates, your comrades, and you travel with them all over the world. Nigel Barrett was on pole in the McLaren M8D with Richard Eyre alongside him in the McLaren M8F. And Chris Childs behind Nigel in um, the March 717. It was uh, Nigel's first pole with Supersports, by far not his first pole of his career, but his first with Supersports. And the point at which they accelerated and went, I would say probably from third to fourth, something went wrong with Nigel's car. Perhaps he shifted down. Perhaps he got a stone in the brake disc or perhaps he hit the brake instead of the accelerator. But the car locked and went sideways. And Chris Charles behind him in the march, which is an inch off the ground, the nine litre car, scooped him up and flew him in the air. At which point the car behind, uh, Ian Barrowman in the Warsteiner toy, took evasive action and went into the wall. Um, Kevin Bartlett in the GT40 sadly did the same and everybody else picked their way through but there was significant damage to a lot of cars. So I was called immediately to race control and interestingly this fascinated me as a wider point. Formula One as a circus brings all its own passes and its own gates. So I was actually um, registered as a plumber and Tim Bamford, the Australian Grand Prix Corporation, as an electrician for us to be able to access race control. So we went in and had an emergency talk and said, yes, let's let's sweep them up and restart the race. 
But very sadly, the March 717 had pulled over on the left-hand side of the circuit and it was reported back to us by the marshals and the stewards that they couldn't get a cherry picker to the car. And in order to get a low load around to it, we would be encroaching potentially onto the Formula One broadcast time, which we had committed to underwrite if we impacted it. So we took probably the hardest decision, at least of my career, to cancel the race um, and bought everybody, swept them up and brought them back into their compound, ready to be shipped back to um, the UK, and then head once rebuilt to Nürburgring in Germany. So that was my probably longest day on the pit lane as an event and a race organiser. Wellbeing. You know the facts. Things are worse than ever. Burnout, trauma, Absence, attrition. Leaders are tired of the empty gesturing about mental health. Leaders are resigned to ticking boxes, obliged to throw money away on medically flimsy, temporary solutions that have failed workforces. Adagio VR is the culmination of decades of work by a fellow of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Partners of the NHS and Oxford University, this is the world's first ever virtual reality programme using clinical therapeutics accessible anywhere. Take meaningful action. Remove the need to cope. Adagio VR. You recount that day as if it was yesterday. It's clearly been a formative experience for you and your career. What did you learn about yourself as you sat with race control? I think the true, true British saying of keep calm and carry on just comes to my forefront of my thinking so often insofar as you're dealing with facts. You're dealing with, there is absolutely no room for emotion or passion or anything other than this is what we want to achieve. Can we achieve it? And if not, how can we assist everybody and cushion this blow to the drivers? Um, And they all understood completely. Um, but it was frustrating insofar as the logistics, the organisation, the fact that we had two amazing races before and what was televised and what we are remembered for perhaps, although the, the series is no longer running, was this third race. Um, but yes, I think in that moment, the mantra of keep calm and carry on Um, You can panic tomorrow, you can cry tomorrow, you can beat your head against a wall tomorrow, but today you have to do your best for absolutely everybody concerned. And it sounds like the risks that you were juggling, as in that very long-form contract, were front and centre, together with the responsibility for the the drivers and um, the vehicles. Is there anything that you wish that you had done different commercially in the run-up to that race that would have meant that you weren't having to shoulder those risks on that day? I think that's a very good question, but Formula One is a machine and it tells you what it wants. And the mere fact that we weren't having to underwrite the cost of the track time was enormous. And so I suppose to some element, you are a a kid in a candy store at that point. And my career probably mantra is be careful what you wish for. And I I wouldn't, I don't regret and I wouldn't change anything, not least because I couldn't, because it was impressed upon us by um, the people that were, we were dealing with um, both in England, the FIA solicitor, a gentleman called Brian Brophy, who sadly no longer with us, but was incredibly informative, basically just said it is what it is and you either want to do it or you don't. And there were many instances where I was quite happy to argue the point or call a, an emergency meeting or protest. But in fact, when it comes to something as special as this, sometimes you've just got to take the bitter pill and realise that it is what it is. And that is a requirement of Formula One. And Formula One is bigger than you. And it's pretty much bigger than anybody in motorsport, rightly or wrongly at the moment. Um So yes, I don't think commercially I could have. Of course, I would have loved to say to you, oh, I wouldn't have underwritten the rights. And um, 
Yeah, all sorts of lovely things, but no, hindsight's a very wonderful thing. So I think we were in a good position and we did the very best with what we could and the tools we had available to us. It sounds like in the run-up to the race, though, that there were a huge number of challenges, not least with your sponsors and respecting their wishes and their needs. It also strikes me that an extraordinary amount of resilience was required to get through that whole experience. What in your career prepared you for that and enabled you to demonstrate resilience on that day? I think I was extremely blessed to have been raised in motorsport. Um, uh, Literally, um, there's pictures of me at two years old at the Monaco Grand Prix in my Tyrrell t-shirt. So to me, motorsport is life. Um, And a day like the day I experienced in Australia, um, I had seen, not organised, but seen many times previously. Um, And it is a spectacular sport and it is a dangerous sport and it is a sport that when something goes wrong, generally it goes stupendously wrong. So um, I think it was my upbringing that allowed me just to keep calm um, and and to deal with it. And I think... um, I've had incidents since, um, which were just as trying, and you just go into a very, very calm zone um, where you're literally just dealing in a process and looking forward to your pillow and your glass of wine at the end of the day. What did you take with you from that experience of, quite frankly, extraordinary delivery? You, You set out on an agenda to do an extraordinary thing, and you delivered that thing, although the race did not go to plan. How did that propel you forwards? What were you able to take in terms of personal satisfaction and a sense of accomplishment? I think um, it made me realise that in my career and in my line of business and with my skills and capability set, I felt confident in motorsport and going forward in business and in various sponsorship deals and commercial agreements to say, yes, what's the question? What do you want? Because I can make it happen. Um, and, and have done so since, um, in a variety of, of, of large scale projects. But if the budget is attainable and if the will is there and if the delivery is correct, then absolutely anything is achievable. Um, And I have um, been very, very lucky to do some extraordinary things in motorsport Um, and to actually, as I said to you, have to rack my brains on, well, which was the longest day. Um, So, yes, I think that's probably um, a very useful thing to me is to realise that you can you can do anything. The only limitation is the belief in yourself, which is quite bizarre as somebody who sometimes has huge imposter syndrome because this was my, inverted commas, family business. So I don't feel sometimes like I've earned the right, even though I'm sitting alongside people who are university educated and legally trained and, you know, I'm, I'm just Caroline who was raised in and loves motorsport and, and has a huge understanding of an industry. So yes, in answer to your question, I think anything's achievable. And funnily enough, the saying um, of the entire race, and it was across all of the billboards, it was on all of the posters, was make every second count. Um, And and I do believe that. Um, I think with a, a good event plan and precise dynamic delivery, I mean, the, one of the key lessons I learned in Australia was I was given a, um, a wire-bound book called Minute by Minute. And from build to strike, it showed every single person what their role and responsibility was minute by minute, from Monday to Monday. There was no shadow of a doubt what you were supposed to do. And I took that away from um, the event and certainly my event plans going forward um, have o- I've always tried to emulate them because yeah make every second count. That is why they say there's nothing quite like Formula One. <laughs> if you had to live your longest day again, what food would you choose to fuel it? 
Oh, that is a good question because I am so naughty about eating when I'm working and I I forget to eat, um, not least because I'm either in meetings with stewards or drivers or driver briefings or, yeah, and there's always amazing food and lovely bars and hospitality and I never get to partake in them. Um, So I think probably um, a good bottle of water and a pocket full of protein bars um, would always get me through. Um, But that's not necessarily what I'd like to eat. But I've never actually been a guest at one of my races and I'd probably be bored to tears, truth be told. Um, So yes, I think um, anything that fits in a pocket is always good. That's fantastic. I do always remark that somehow we never have the same response to this question and that long may it continue. <laughs> Caroline, thank you for sharing that story that doesn't feel like it was 23 years ago, 24 <laughs> years ago. Um, it, it does feel very recent in memory, um, but it is extraordinary what you were able to achieve and so much that you've done since. So thank you for sharing your experiences with us on The Longest Day. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to a Broadstairs Consulting Limited podcast. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. Tune in soon to hear the next installment of The Longest Day. Copyright 2024, production copyright, Broadstairs Consulting Limited, all rights reserved.